Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC guy. Today I want to talk about wiring your layout for DCC. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to address before we move on and talk about actual wiring uh, came up in my video on uh, installing a DCC system on your model railroad. And in that, I talked about wiring up this uh, power supply. And I showed you, you know, how I wired it. And I talked about different wire colors for the line-in connections from your main uh, household power. What I was talking about was American uh, standards. In America, the colors that I talked about are used on American wires. And they will probably be different for other countries around the world. Uh, you have to be aware that your color system for wires may be different than what is used here in the United States. Uh, you need to check with your local experts on wiring at your local model railroad club or, or an electrician you know and find out what the differences are. Also, one thing that uh, I, uh, I will constantly be referring to is the gauge of various wires. And again, I'm talking in terms of the American Wire Gauge System, AWG for uh, an abbreviation. And I'll go over, uh, you know, the different uses of the different gauges of wire. But just to give you a, a, a quick heads up, I looked up online and found uh, a reference table that cross reference between the AWG system and the metric system, which is used in a lot of countries. And basically, a 12 gauge wire corresponds to something on the order of a 4 uh, millimeter square wire. And apparently in metric countries, they um, basically look at the square millimeter uh, area of a cross section of wire. Okay, so 12 gauge is approximately 4. Uh, 14 gauge is about two and a half square millimeters, and an 18 gauge wire is about one square millimeter. So, you know, if, if, if I'm talking about using one of those gauges of wire, um, then I recommend that you take a look uh, online somewhere, do a, a quick Google search for wire gauges, and find out how to translate, you know, what I'm talking about in terms of AWG to what is used and available in your country. So that, you know, we're, we're at least working, you know, from the same template anyway, when it comes to the sizes of the wires that we're gonna be using on our model railroads. So let's go ahead and take a look then at uh, some of the things you have to be aware of when it comes to wiring a model railroad. And remember, there's a big difference between DCC wiring and DC wiring. When you when you're uh, wiring a DC layout, you're only worrying about one power pack at a time. And they're usually rated at under an amp, okay? So you only, uh, only have to have wire big enough to carry that amperage. With DCC, on the other hand, your uh, booster or command station booster combination is providing power for the whole layout in many cases. And you're working at a much higher amperage, typically three amps, 5 amps, 8 amps, uh, and in some cases 10 amps. So you have to have wire that's robust enough to take that amperage, okay? And that's the big difference. Also, DC uh, power is very different than DCC. I mean, DC is just out and back. That's all it is, straightforward system. Uh, with DCC, it is a very different critter. It's a square wave form. It's very similar to AC, but it has uh, digital communication signals built into the waveform. And for that reason, it, it's more than just a, a DCC power bus you're dealing with. It's also a data communications bus. And because of that, you have to be aware of certain data communication protocols. For example, very early with the telephone system, uh, they found that they had to go to twisted pairs of wires in order to uh, exclude a lot of electromagnetic interference and that kind of thing. And as a result, um, a lot of, and this is a basic uh, communication cable, it's a Cat5 cable, uh, typically used for your uh, computer connections in your house and offices, and you can see it consists of multiple uh, strands 
of wire that are twisted around each other. And many, uh, and, and what I'm going to show you later is that you actually might want to consider doing this with your DCC power bus, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, so there is a big difference then between DC and DCC wiring in general. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I have covered in books that I've published in the past, specifically uh, this one for Combat came out in 2015, Wiring Your Model Railroad. This book has been around for, you know, decades in various forms by different authors. Uh, I wrote the 2015 version of it that's in current uh, production. Andy Sprandio had a version out b before me and others before him. So it's one of those books that we regularly update at Comback, and you can get that from Comback Books or off of um, Amazon even. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today was covered in that book. Also, more recently, this book here, DCC Projects and Applications, Volume 4, which I uh, authored, and uh, it has a lot of, of the material uh, on DC wire, DCC wire sizes and signals and ways of dealing with problems with those. So both of these, again, were published by Comback within the last five years. So if you're looking for something to refer to, you know, I recommend these. And like I said, you can get them from Combat Books, uh, their uh, hobby store online, or you can get them from Amazon.com. Okay, first let's talk about the different sizes of wire uh, that can be used. Now, I uh, typically do not use um, anything larger than 14 gauge wire. This uh, red wire here is a 14 gauge wire. Um, it uh, is solid copper. It is not stranded. And I used to use this for the buses under my layout. And this, you know, it works great. And you can use this for most of your uh, layout needs. And I recommend this for HO gauge. Now, for different gauges, like I said earlier, you need different sizes of wire. And um, for, um, for O gauge, I would recommend something in the order of 12 to 10 gauge wire. And that's pretty good size stuff. Now, I do know uh, that some people use... Uh, you know, 12 gauge or, or larger for their model railroads for HO scale. And typically those people have layouts that might be a hundred foot of run uh, for their power bus. So they need a much, much larger diameter wire. Now for S scale and HO scale, I'm talking about using a 16 to 12 gauge wire. So for most purposes, uh, most mid-sized layouts, 14 gauge is going to be sufficient. Uh, if you're using, if you are building a 4x8 foot layout, then 16 gauge is going to be enough. If you're building a basement empire, like I just said, then you probably want to move up to 12 gauge wire for very long runs. And I'm talking runs longer than about 30 feet. Um, if you're dealing with N scale and Z scale uh, layouts, then we're looking at something on the order of 18 to 16 gauge. And remember, with the AWG system, the larger the number, the smaller the diameter of the wire. Okay, um, so that's the size ranges that, that I would recommend. And as I said, in those two books uh, that I showed earlier, I have tables uh, of the different wire sizes and what I recommend. Now, why are we, we so concerned about uh, the different gauges of wire? Well, it it runs into a couple of factors. One is resistance. And when you pass a, a, a current through a wire, it's going to have a certain amount of resistance. Now, the good thing about copper wire is that it's a very good conductor. So it's not a big issue. But just to give you some ideas, uh, at one amp with a 14 gauge wire, you're going to lose 0 0.01 uh, volts per foot of travel. So you get a, uh, and with the 5 amp, it's going to be 5 times that, or 0.05 volts. So the longer your runs are, and the larger the amperage uh, of, of current flowing through those wires, then the larger they need to be in order to prevent this voltage drop issue becoming a problem for you. And why does that become an issue? Well, 
Uh, for one thing, if you lose too many volts out at the end of the layout, uh, you might actually lose control of your locomotives because the decoders themselves need a certain voltage in order to be able to operate. So you might find things dropping out, like sound dropping out, uh, at far ends of a, of a layout that uh, is inadequately wired. Another problem that can happen is um, you can actually uh, run into an issue where the command station or boosters are not able to actually detect uh, when a short occurs on the layout. They just think it's a large enough, a much larger load, and they just keep pumping out the amps to it. So in order for your layout to properly operate and for your command station and boosters and circuit breakers to adequately shut down during shorts and overloads, you need to have a good strong signal flowing through the rails, and that means keeping the voltage up. So at different gauges then, uh, you will have different voltage drops per foot of travel. So that's one reason why uh, you would want a larger wire for very long runs compared to a short wire, okay? You get less voltage drop per foot of travel when you're using a larger diameter wire than a smaller diameter wire. And that's why I say, you know, anything over 30 feet, you're looking at something uh, in HO scale, about 12 gauge. Uh, for anything under 30 feet, probably 14 gauge is going to be sufficient. If you're you know, very short runs, under 10 feet maybe, then you could drop down to a 16 gauge wire for a, a small four by eight foot type model railroad that you typically see in the magazines. Um, let's see, another thing to be aware of, um, and that is nickel silver rail. Now nickel silver rail is not silver, it uh, is 60% copper, about 20% nickel and 20% zinc. And it has a tendency also to resist the flow of electricity through it. Matter of fact, and it's much greater than copper wire, you will find that the voltage drop will uh, increase uh, as the uh, rail becomes smaller. So going from code 100 to code 55, you're going to lose more voltage per foot of travel. And just to give you an example, at one amp with code 100 track, you're going to be losing something about 0.056 volts per foot of travel. At 5 amps, it's 0.28 volts. When you get down to something like code 70, uh, we're looking at, um, at 5 amps, 0.76 volts per foot of travel. Okay, So over 10 feet, you're looking at 7.6 volts drop. That is significant. So those are some of the issues you have to be concerned about with your rail. Because as you move uh, down the track, um, at smaller scales, if you put in uh, two feeders at the beginning of a 10-foot section of track, and that's all, then by the time the locomotive gets down to the end of the track, it might not have enough power for you to even operate it any longer. So that's why it's a good idea to uh, provide feeders every six feet or so, depending on the, the, the rails. Now, I typically use uh, a feeder every six feet on my layout with my 14-gauge wire and with my code 83 rail. Uh, on other sections of my layout where I'm using code 70 rail, and I use that in some of my sidings and, and industrial areas, that kind of thing, then you're going to want uh, to uh, have feeders more often. So in those cases, I would put in feeders every three feet in order to guarantee that I'm going to be able to operate my locomotives uh, throughout that entire area. So if you're planning a logging operation with code 70 rail, then be aware that uh, you're probably going to need feeders every three or four feet, something along that order, in order to adequately keep your layout powered and keep your locomotives running properly. What I want to talk about now, though, is uh, different kinds of wire. Because I use two different kinds of wire and different sizes of wire on my layout. So as I say, I use the 14 gauge wire for my power buses. And that's all of my buses. My main buses, my subsidiary buses that power branch lines and yards and little things like that. Uh, for feeders, 
feeders, I use a 20 gauge solid wire. And why do I use solid? Well, if you ever try to fish or push a stranded wire like this one up through a hole uh, through the bottom of your layout, it's sort of like pushing a piece of wet spaghetti across a wet countertop in your kitchen. You're not going to have a lot of luck in some, kind, in some cases with this. And that can be an issue. Also, when I go to install a feeder on my layout, I will usually take the bare end of the wire and put a little 90 degree dog leg in that. And basically, what that allows me to do is, I can solder this to the underside of the rail, or I can solder it to the side of the rail. Okay? And it's a lot easier to work with a solid piece of wire in those kind of situations. So what do I use the flexible uh, stranded wire for? Well, as I say, flex stranded wire is flexible. So in locations where you're going to be moving your wire a lot, uh, stranded wire is not going to break as easily as a piece of solid uh, wire will. So in areas such as uh, my control panels and places like that where I'm going to be moving them a lot and the wires are going to be you know, flexing quite a bit, this is the kind of wire that you need. So that's where I use stranded wires. And I mean, you can use stranded wire for your feeders. One thing you can do is strip the end of the wire uh, quite a bit and put solder on it and that will make it firm. And it, and it will be easier to push it up through the layout and, and uh, attach it to your rails. I just prefer, you know, to use solid wire for that and use this for situations where I need a flexible wire instead. Well, uh, I think that's enough for this video. Um, it's already running almost 20 minutes in length. So what I'm going to do is break it into two parts and we'll talk about the more complex issue of inductance related problems in a second video that I'll probably come out with on Wednesday. So look for it then. And again, come back on Friday for a look at uh, power management and how that works as far as distributing power on our layout using circuit breakers and power management devices. Because I think it's something that most people are not aware of and it can be a very useful tool. And I talk about it in an article in uh, the uh, one of those books that I showed you earlier. In the meantime, uh, have a good week and uh, stay safe out there. Bye now.